The gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. This is the lectionary gospel reading today, which means that it's being used by Christian congregations around the world. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when this will be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I add my welcome to um, Kitty's, to Voitech. It's a real gift to have this friendship across the years, nurtured in Jesus Christ. I feel, as he expressed, the same way that it's a wonderful gift from God that we should have this clear manifestation of how connected we are in the body of Christ. And I appreciate the congregation working to be good stewards of that gift and nurturing the friendship because it is something precious to us that we can share in this relationship this way. Welcome, sir. And I also add my happy birthday to the others expressed, to Kenny already. At the beginning of the week, we were talking about who was preaching in here, and I said, well, it's your birthday. I'll preach across the three. I actually think he wanted to preach in here today. I think he likes preaching, but it just seemed the better part of friendship for me to offer to do that for him here today. So, and here I look out and I see Jody and Xander. Didn't you all just get married? Heavens to Murgatroyd, what are you doing here? Yeah. And John and Carol Wells just had a baby? What are they doing here? Yeah. Thanks be to God that we can gather like this in the midst of joys and also the trials that we have in the Christian life. Had, has anybody here ever seen the TV show Clarkson's Farm? Clarkson's Farm. Raise your hand if you have, just so I can see. There's no shame in it. Yeah. It's a good show. I'm just surprised because I'm watching it regularly, all right? And I'm surprised that I've only got two people in here, me and you, who are watching this show. And so I recommend it to you. It's the show that Emily and I go to as kind of our regular chill when we have an opportunity to do something together. Uh, and that's because if we try to watch anything else, it takes us a solid week to agree on what we would watch together. But this is an easy yes from both of us. And the, it's built around a man named Jeremy Clarkson, who's a famous uh, English race car driver. Does that name ring a bell? Jeremy Clarkson, all right? He's well known in Britain and the United Kingdom and Europe as a race car driver, and is very famous. He's a big husky guy, and he's excellent with machines. But the premise of the show, which is on one of the mainline streaming services, you can watch it, the premise is that he has taken possession of a farm in England, in the Cotswold region, and it's a large farm, all right? And he has to, from scratch, learn how to operate, operate the farm with his spouse helping him. And it's just a reality show following their foibles and also their successes. And we really enjoy it. But because he's into machinery and engines, one of the first things he has to do is to buy a tractor. And so when he goes to buy this tractor, he buys a Mercedes, literally. He buys a Mercedes tractor, which as a modern tractor is not only super expensive, but is way beyond what they need. It's so big, when he gets it home, he can't get it into the barn. It's his first mistake. It has air conditioning, it has television in it, it has a radio, it has a, a stereo system, it has a phone. At any rate, he's coached by the Cotswold natives who have been farming forever. And he goes to plant one of the many fields that he has to plant. And as he's entertained in his tractor, he ends up, instead of making a straight line, 
a line that goes all over the field. And this is a problem if you're planting a big crop, all right, because it doesn't maximize your yield and you have a hard time getting machinery into harvest or to fertilize. And so the Cotswold farmers are hollering at him from the side, straighten up, straighten up, Jeremy. And they pan back and show what a labyrinth he's uh, planted as he moves forward. And they keep saying to him, Jeremy, you've got to find an object on the other side of the field and watch that while you're driving. Stay off of the phone. Focus up front. Ride to your mark. And that's the lesson there in it. Now we have this passage, um, and it makes me think of the portico out front of the sanctuary. I, I guess you notice that it's all fenced off, and um, it's uh, been an adventure since the hurricane came. We've discovered that it wasn't as secure as we thought, and the Milton was a blessing for us in that sense because we're having to replace the columns, and there are um, scaffolds that are going up that will hold it up while the columns come down and are replaced. You know, that portico has been there since 1947, which is just about um, 70 years. And we never realized that the interior of those columns wasn't steel, that it was wood. Um, and the hurricane revealed that to us. And the um, wood that was used in 1947 isn't pressurized wood. It wasn't around yet. So it's especially vulnerable wood that way. Even things I thought would be there forever also can crumble. Even when they still look like they're standing strong. Now here, we're at, as the gospel tells it, the last week of Jesus' life. And this is the last passage in our journey with Jesus before his passion. In Mark's gospel, the next things that happen to Jesus will be his arrest and his crucifixion, even in this week. So this is an important passage because it's the last thing the disciples remember that Jesus said to them before the, before the turmoil of his crucifixion begins to take place now. And it's really two conversations. Did you notice that? The first conversation is right outside the temple, which is a very public conversation. Everybody can hear it. And then the next conversation is actually on the Mount of Olives, which is about a mile away. And they're sitting there looking over at Jerusalem and looking at the temple. It's a very public conversation and a very private conversation with just four of the disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, who are gathered there. Mark seems to want to pull Andrew into the same intimate circle with Peter, James, and John. All right, we know that at Gethsemane it's Peter, James, and John, but here Mark's memory is that Andrew is pulled in there as well. And we get these two conversations, and in it, the disciples at the temple, I'm, I'm thinking they must have felt like they were at the top of their game at that moment. Because Jesus was having such success as a teacher, he was able even to refute the scribes and indeed at times to get their endorsement. He was a sensation. And what they didn't know is that they were just days away from his arrest and his crucifixion. And they're also just years away, perhaps two, two decades, from the whole temple being torn down by the Romans because of the Jewish rebellion. And on the preface of that, they're saying, look at these huge stones, Jesus. Have you ever seen anything as great as this? Now, I remember in Hurricane Milton, I had somebody in my family who rode out that hurricane at All Children's Hospital, and from their room, they were able to look out the window, and they saw the roof of the Tropicana Stadium being blown off. That was something, it wasn't worth the price of admission, but it was something worth seeing as that happened there. And I remember when the trop was built. Anybody else remember that? It was a big deal. I mean, it was the height of technology. I remember even the restaurant I ate at in celebration before I went to my first event there at, at Tropicana Stadium. And now I've seen the roof blow off. In my own lifetime, and the church portico being replaced as well. And this is a good thing for us to encounter and remember. Because we have a real tendency to drift towards idolatry, ador adoration of structures that we build, whether they're institutions or whether they're buildings. It's a real human tendency to drift towards idolatry of things we make. 
Look at these huge stones at this temple, Jesus. It's good for us to remember that structures we build and the little empires we think we build, that all of that will one day fade away. Ultimately, none of that is left standing. That's the witness of the gospel today. You know another building that's going to crumble? Another one that you're very close to? It's the building you're walking around in right now. What the New Testament calls the tent that you're living your life in, that also is not only going to crumble away, but is in the process of crumbling. In some of us, it's more advanced than it is in others. Therefore, the gospel says, be sure to focus on the things that endure. It's an, an irony, I think. It's either exact irony or near irony that when the disciples are standing there, pointing at the stones, saying to Jesus, look how long these things will endure, and they're going to crumble. They're speaking that to the one thing that's going to endure, the incarnate Word of God in Jesus Christ. So Isaiah says, the grass withers, and the flower fades away, but the word of the Lord, that endures forever, Isaiah 48. And the disciples say, look at these stones. Look how big they are. They're going to crumble, and they're saying that to Jesus, who is the one thing who will endure. Focus on the person, the character, the actions, the teachings, and the life of Jesus. That's the best strategy for moving towards God's kingdom. Focusing on the lessons of Jesus and the life of Jesus and the character, that's the best strategy for us to move towards God's kingdom. You remember God's kingdom, God's kingdom. That's the one you pray for every week. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's the kingdom you've been praying for all along. And the best way to move towards it is by focusing on the life and the character of Jesus. And in the second conversation, the intimate one on the Mount of Olives, they say to him, Jesus, tell us what the future is going to be like. And, and I think they're looking for something glorious. And he says to them, it's going to be full of turbulence and tumult. Don't be surprised by that. And don't let it distract you. Don't let it cause you to lose your focus. Some people will come and they'll say, I am he about Jesus. But Jesus says, they will lead many astray. Verse 6, many will come in my name and say, I am he and they will lead many astray. Sarah Mickelson and I appreciate a Greek scholar named Mark Davis who says about this verse, this includes not only folks who come saying they are Jesus, and we certainly have had a lot of those historically over time, but this also includes things that people do in the name of Jesus, all right? Uh, cloaking actions in Christianity that don't look like the actions of Jesus at all as you find them reported to you in the Gospels, all right? Jesus is saying here, you focus on the life, the character, and the actions of Jesus. That will be your compass. Don't be alarmed, he said, which is like the don't be afraid when he's walking in the storm to the disciples in the boat. Remember, the future belongs to God. Remember that. I've been saying that line to myself as kind of a mantra. The future belongs to God. Do you remember when we started this journey reading through Mark's gospel a year ago, the first passage we read on the first Sunday in Advent in December of 2023? You remember that, don't you? No, it was just 52 Sundays ago. It was from this chapter in Mark. We are ending the same place we began, with the gospel remembering that Jesus said, focus on me, don't be alarmed, the future belongs to God. Why does the church recall this conversation? Why does it remember this right before the stories of Jesus' death, his arrest, his crucifixion? I think it's because they were going to go through such tumult and such turbulence. They were going to live through their own arrest. They were going to see the temple be torn down. Some of them would live to see that. And this memory of Jesus saying, when that happens, don't be alarmed. Focus on me, my life, my love, my kindness, as you find it repeated in the stories of the gospel. Focusing on the person 
character and truths of Jesus is the best strategy for moving towards the community that God is calling us to. Even when the buildings start to fall down. Remember, Jeremy, focus on Jesus. Amen.